All right, uh, welcome back everyone to our next uh, geophysics and tectonics seminar. Uh, I'm excited to announce that our speaker this week is Anne uh, Glerum uh, from GFZ Potsdam. Uh, who will be talking to us about uh, continental rift interaction and the formation of rotating continental microplates. Um, so thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Glerum. And uh, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work on rotating continental microplates. This work was done in a collaboration with Derek Neuhardt, Sasha Kuna, Sarah Stamps, Manfred Stecker, uh, Christian Heine, and Kim Welford. And it focuses on a currently active microplate in East Africa and two proposed ancient microplates along the passive margins of the Atlantic. And I will demonstrate with um, two numerical studies what mechanisms are at play during microplate rotation and under which circumstances rotating continental microplates form. First, let's take a bit of a broader perspective. Microplates form in both the continental and the oceanic lithosphere, and they are actually quite numerous and diverse, and they can form in many different tectonic settings like uh, subduction, accreting, and collision, but during the talk, I will focus on extensional settings only. And I've just highlighted a few here on this map. Like one well-known example is the Easter microplate over here, um, which is currently active, so um, in the East Pacific rise. And with active, I mean here that it's moving, so rotating independently of the surrounding major plates. And um, the continental microplate Victoria, on the other hand, on the other hand um, is a currently active microplate um, that formed through the interaction of two continental rift branches. Then um, remnants of microplates can also be found, for example, the Yan Mayan uh, microplate and the Sao Paulo Plateau over here. And they formed during the opening of the North and the South Atlantic. Now both analog and numerical modeling have been used to better understand under what conditions microplates in extensional settings form. And take, for example, like oceanic microplates like Easter that have been studied with wax models of oceanic spreading leading to amazing movies like these. So um, overlapping spreading centers nucleate along oblique sections the microplate starts growing and rotating and these distinct um, triangular areas form from the juxtaposition of very new lithosphere against a bit older lithosphere like uh, a second microplate even forms the microplate keeps growing and then all of a sudden one of the ridges goes extinct and the microplate um, attaches itself to the uh, lower major plate now, what we've learned from studies like this is that oceanic microplates form between two overlapping spreading centers. Um, they rotate fast around a vertical axis and they are short-lived, so five to 10 million years. And during their lifetime, they accrete, they keep growing. Now, if I just rotate this figure, because um, Schouten et al. formulated a kinematic model called edge-driven kinematics for oceanic microplates like Easter that states that the drag of the major plates here and here um, on the microplate drives the rotation. So here, the spreading of the plates here and here drives the rotation through drag. And at the same time, the microplate is bounded by weak overlapping ridge segments on the boundaries um, orthogonal to the spreading direction. And as we will see later on, um, the same mechanism is important for continental microplate rotation. Now, in analog, as well as in numerical models of rift interaction, ridge interaction, the initial offset of the approaching ridges was shown to be important. And with offset, I mean the lateral distance between the two approaching ridges over here. For example, Garia used um, 3D numerical models of um, initially underlapping ridges. Um, and he showed that for um, short initial offset, so up to 40 kilometers, straight um, oblique connections form. While for intermediate offsets, 40 to 60 kilometers, we get transform folds. And as we can see in the top view, 
of the viscosity over here. For 60 kilometer offsets, we get these um, overlapping spreading centers with a growing rotating microplate in between. Now, more recent studies have showed that for continental extension and the interaction of continental rifts, initial offset also determines the type of linkage between rifts. Note, however, that both the spatial and the temporal scale is very different. So now we're talking about initial offsets of 100 to 400 kilometers and um, temp temporal evolutions of 10 to 25 million years. Now here we see top views of 3D models of Le Bourrier et al. And um, what they show, uh, besides the topography <laughs> and the strain rate, is that for very low and um, high initial offset, it doesn't matter whether the lower crust is stronger or weaker. We either have this oblique straight connection or there is no mechanical interaction between the rifts at all. However, for intermediate offsets, um, the, the, off, the, the strength of the lower crust determines whether there is an oblique connection or a very, very oblique connection. Now, the effects of pre-existing lithospheric heterogeneity on rift linkage have also been investigated, for example, by Bruna et al. And they use 3D models of two approaching rifts, as you can see here in, the, in this little figure. And they approach this um, northwest trending heterogeneity of the lithosphere. And um, the two approaching rifts, they, they bend left, left laterally away from um, this heterogeneity. And this leads to a right lateral step over and wide distributed deformation in the heterogeneous area. Now, depending on the initial lithospheric thickness and the crustal thickness in the uh, heterogeneous area, um, deformation in the area can also become very um, narrow, but still with this left bending um, um, propagation direction. And for even stronger plates, microplates can form that rotate counterclockwise. And we can see from the strain rate areas, so it's white, so it's a very rigid um, plate. Now, if the mental strength is equal um, in the um, heterogeneous area to the strength in the rifts, then the, the um, rift just propagates directly and it's not, the inherited structure is not noticed by the model. So taking all this together, we now know that growing oceanic microplates rotate fast through edge-driven kinematics. These oceanic microplates form for certain specific geometries of little overlap and offset. Continental rifts interact uh, differently depending on the offset and the crustal strength. And under particular strength heterogeneity, they can form um, rotating continental microplates. And strength contrast can influence the propagation direction and deformation style. And armed with this knowledge, we will now zoom in on the Victoria continental microplate. And as we can see on this beautiful image of East Africa with the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden over here, um, the Victoria microplate can be found in between the Western and the Eastern branch of the East Africa Rift system. And this system runs um, from the Afar region in the North all the way down to Mozambique. And from geodetic observations, we know Victoria is currently rotating independently from Nubia in the West and Somalia in the East. And the question we have to answer is why? <laughs> and I will uh, demonstrate a possible mechanism behind the current rotation of Victoria and how this rotation is controlled by the lithospheric structure of East Africa. And this work was published um, last year. So as I said, the present day um, motion along the East African risk system has been derived from geodetic data inversion. And overall, Nubia and Somalia move in this northwest, north northwest direction. And their relative motion is uh, more or less east west, as you can see from these um, black factors along the plate contact over here. And when keeping Nubia fixed, the motion of Somalia can be represented by a, a clockwise rotation around the Euler Pole in the Southwest Indian Ocean. 
And in fact, the other microplates that have been distinguished in the plate boundary zone, so Ravuma and Lewandu, uh, Ravuma and Lewandu over here, they also move clockwise as far as the data permits us to say. However, Victoria moves uh, counterclockwise around an Euler pole slightly north as represented by the purple stars north of Victoria. Now, previous authors have suggested a mantle driver for the rotation of Victoria. So from seismic tomography and isotope studies, we know there is a northeast directed mantle upwelling beneath Southeast Africa. And we also know that um, the Victoria microplate encompasses the Tanzania Craton, which is an Archean Craton with a keel that's possibly thickest in the south. And Khaled all therefore suggested that stenospheric flow interacting with the keel of the Craton could produce the counterclockwise motion of the microplate. Also, um, Koptev et al. noticed a counterclockwise rotation in 3D numerical models of an off-center plume interacting with a cratonic block, and they figure the asymmetric forcing of the plume on the craton induces its rotation. However, <laughs> we propose to first look at um, lithospheric drivers and controls. So when we zoom in around Victoria, we see the curved western branch and the eastern branch, and these partly overlap. Uh, should ring a bell. <laughs> so under the relative east-west plate motion, this will induce uh, oblique abstention along the wrist segments, which are shown in, in red here. Also, there is clearly a relation between the rift segments and the weaker proterozoic mobile belts that are these dashed areas um, here and here. Um, yeah, and moreover, the rift branches, the tips of the branches, they seem to terminate against areas that can be interpreted as strong. So there's um, the failed Cretaceous rift over here. And um, the western branch also terminates in the Tanzania Craton, which is thick and strong. It's an Archean uh, Craton. So we think this configuration of weaker and stronger areas of the lithosphere controls the rotation of Victoria. And we propose that um, along the stronger or these rift normal sides of the microplate, the um, motion of the major plates, so Nubia and Somalia, is transferred to the microplate. So the major plates drag the smaller plate on opposite side. And the rotation that is thus induced is then facilitated by the weaker um, extension normal sides, these sides, where the crust fails. So hence the geometry of the weak and the stronger areas is likely to control um, the rotation of Victoria. And this mechanism is inspired by this edge-driven mechanism proposed for the fast rotating uh, microplates, oceanic microplates by Schout et al. So to test this edge-driven mechanism in a continental setting for a large continental microplate, we set up a numerical model with the code aspect. And the model is of this, on the scale of the East African risk system. So it's 2,100 kilometers by 2,700 by um, 300. And for 300 million years model time, we prescribe this east-west extension on the east and west boundary. And um, this, this normal velocity is compensated by inflow through the bottom. And importantly, <laughs> importantly we ra slightly raised the mental lithosphere, so here, um, to incorporate the weakness of the mobile belts. And to mimic the general layout of the rift system, we raised the LAB along these two branches that follow the outline of an ellipse. And as you can see from these strength profiles, the thinner lithosphere in these mobile belts, so the lithosphere, mental lithosphere, this dark green, um, will, will, has, has, gives, gives a, um, a smaller lithospheric strength. So this is where um, deformation will localize, just like in the East African root system. Now, LAB and crustal thickness variations lead to the stronger regions of the Tanzania Craton, so the third figure, and the Turkana depression. So what happens when we extend the model with these ellipsoidal mobile belts for 10 million years? 
that we can see here in these three snapshots of the strain rate in blues, the velocity uh, indicated by the black arrows, and the maximum horizontal compressive stress uh, expressed by the bars colored according to tectonic regime. So there's red for normal folding, green for strike slip, and then um, blue for truss folding. So over time, deformation localizes um, in the mobile belts, while the microplate in between behaves more and more coherently, as we can see from this increasing white area, which is low strain rate. The overall velocity field is east to west, so corresponding to the applied boundary conditions. However, close and inside the microplate, what we can see in the zoom in, the um, velocity field um, actually shows this counterclockwise rotation. And we can also see that from these light blue arrows, which I exaggerated compared to the rest of the arrows. Similarly, the overall direction of the maximum horizontal compressive stress is north-south oriented. And in the normal floating regime, so all the, most of the bars are red. <laughs> and, uh, but it curves along the rift segments and in front of the rift tips as well. And actually, the orientation of the stress agrees with previous studies that showed that for oblique rifting, the stress direction is the bisector of the relative velocity normal and the rift trend. Now, to make um, changes in evolution of subsequent models more tangible, I quantified a rotation of the microplate by computing the pole that describes the rotation of the microplate with respect to Nubia, so with respect to the, the Western plate the left plate. And um, for the symmetric reference model, this pole ends up here, uh, slightly north of the domain, but in the center of the horizontal direction, as expected. So the first set of model variations to identify what controls the microplate rotation concerns the initial extent of the overlap of the mobile belts, so the, the opening angle of the ellipsoidal arms, so to say. And in the reference case, the opening angle is 90 degrees, but um, smaller opening angles like 30 and 60, they uh, do not lead to coherent plate-like behavior, but they show these additional um, localization along segments along the what could have been the microplate. And conversely, greater opening angles show increased plate-like behavior. So for 150 degrees, the um, the branches, they connect to the opposite um, rifts and the, the microplate is basically not moving. So we can again compute the um, Euler poles or the, the rotation poles and then plot them on the right. So this is the reference case again, and this is the size of the model domain. And then um, the other poles show that rotation is greatest for an opening angle of 90 degrees and for other angles, the poles move northward and rotation velocity is smaller. Now the shape and the size of the microplate or the, the aspect ratio of the ellipse also proves important. When we increase the width of the ellipse while equally, equally increasing the domain or keeping the domain width fixed, we again obtain predominantly normal folding and uh, when we compare the rotation poles, it becomes obvious that the aspect ratio of one to two of the reference ellipse is uh, optimum. For other ratios, the poles move northward again. Now, as this geometry of the weak and, and the stronger regions proves crucial, let's now consider a less abstracted configuration based on the actual geometry of the East African Ridge system. And when we incorporate such a mobile belt configuration, which is no longer symmetric and includes a bit more overlap of the two rift branches, we obtain these um, velocity and stress predictions. Now, the velocity field again shows this counterclockwise rotation. And again, these um, light blue arrows, they are five times exaggerated so that we can see the rotation better. And um, we can summarize this rotation by um, this rotation pole <laughs> in brown over here. And interestingly, when we zoom in on the most oblique center, 
the most oblique section of this um, Western branch in the black box over here, we can see that at 5 million years, some strike slip occurred. So we have green bars, but then this is transient at 10 million years. They, uh, this, is, this is not seen. There's only some oblique normal folding. Yeah, so now what happens when we make the stronger areas even stronger by including the thick Tanzania crazen in the center image or um, the thinned crust of the Turkana depression. In the first case, the coupling of Somalia to the microplate in the Southeast increases and the motion of the microplate increases in this direction. So we can see that from the, the larger blue arrows. And this is mirrored in the larger um, rotation pool uh, here on the right that, that we can invert for again. So stress is diverted along the edge of the craton as is the rift um, tip actually. And including the Turkana depression also leads to a deviation of the stress field to, to parallel uh, the depression. And transmission of motion from the major plate to the microplate is now stronger in the Northwest. So we have a larger rotation pole that is displaced slightly to the West. So, the, in, in real life, the opening of the East African Rift system is faster in the north than in the south, opening like this. So when we incorporate um, such a gradient in the velocity in our boundary conditions, then um, we in effect lower the extension along the southern part of the microplate and that we can see from the smaller blue vectors over here again. And the rotation pole is therefore smaller and displaced to the west. Now, the rotated local velocity field is in fact more oblique and this um, slightly prolongs the phase of strike slip deformation. So we still have some green bars over here. Now combining all this, so the southward decrease in velocity, the thicker lithosphere of the Tanzania Craton and the thin crust of the Turkana depression then predicts this pole over here and this um, shows that we fall within the space spanned by the poles from geodetic data inversion and their uncertainties. Now, that brings me to the conclusions of this first set of numerical experiments. For one, we have demonstrated that as we hypothesized, the motion of the major plates transmitted to the microplates along its stronger edges can cause a continental microplate to rotate. An asthenospheric driver is not required to induce this rotation, but we are working on quantifying a possible um, contribution. Now, secondly, we can conclude that for a given set of boundary conditions, the distribution of the weaker and stronger areas controls the rotation of the microplate in terms of rotation velocity and pole position. Thirdly, the distribution of lithospheric heterogeneities can control the rotation of the Victoria continental, continental microplate in particular. And our model predictions on the left are similar to those from uh, geodynamic modeling on the right. And in this case, the brown arrows represent the relative velocity of the plate on the right side of the um, plate boundary with respect to the plate on the left. Now, both uh, sets of brown arrows show this increase in velocity um, along the Nubia Victoria plate boundary and increase towards the north along the Victoria Somalia plate boundary. And this uh, microplate motion leads to a clockwise rotation of the local velocity field. And in the most oblique section of the rift can lead to um, strike slip faulting instead of normal faulting. Now, um, we can also conclude that the local rotation in this overall east-west extending region leads to local east-southeast, west-northwest um, extension. And this local extension direction and and the obliquity of the, the rift itself then determine the local stress regime, which in our case is mostly normal faulting. 
a comparison of our predicted stress to the world stress map database. Um, so the second figure here um, shows how well this edge driven um, kinematics also captures the dynamics of the East Africa system. Both predictions and observations, they show mostly normal faulting with the stress um, aligning itself along the curved uh, rift arms. And then there are some strike slip in and along the craton. And the inference we can make from our stress predictions is therefore that the translation from local stress direction to regional extension direction is not so straightforward. And we need to take into account smaller scale sources of stress reorientation. Also, um, as Morley proposed in 2010, uh, it's likely that local heterogeneity, such as foliation of the mobile belts, plays a role in um, this, this very oblique section of the rift, where our predictions indicate some strike slip, which is um, not observed. Now, although we might lack this smallest scale source of stress reorientation in our, our numerical models, the models do provide predictions on both the regional and local scale of the kinematics and the dynamics. So um, the East African Rift System has been interpreted kinematically in several ways based on field observations and geometric considerations. So as a system, uh, as a strike slip system in, in um, Northwest Southeast extension with major strike slip here and here. Um, as a system under east-west extension, where some horizontal slip is expected in the most oblique segments here and here. And then most recently, um, based on focal mechanisms as a system under overall east-west extension, but undergoing rift normal dip slip faulting in most of the sections. And now with our models, we think we can unify, unify these views. So under um, regional east-west extension, as derived from the geodetic data and the plate reconstructions, local extension directions are more uh, west, northwest, east, southeast. And then depending on the orientation of the mobile belts and thus the rift segments, segments, this rotation either enhances or lessens the rift of liquidity. And this would lead to um, some strike slip in this region. Now, small scale inherited anisotropic and I saw to repeat, however, uh, can lead to local reorientations of the stress fields such that even in the most oblique sections, uh, normal faulting is the dominant regime. Okay, so now that we've seen how, how act, an active continental microplate can rotate um, in a system guided by strength heterogeneities, I'd like to turn your attention to ancient microplates or remnant microplates that can be found in passive margins, such as the Sao Paulo Plateau in the South Atlantic. And this is work uh, by Derek Neuhart, who just last month published this as part of his PhD. And we wanted to use numerical modeling to provide the missing link between the active microplates and the remnants that can be found in the geological record and then model their entire evolution from rift inception to segment overlap, this vertical axis rotation, and then um, continental breakup. Now, the Sao Paulo Plateau is a marginal plateau situated in the Santos Basin here off the coast of Brazil. And uh, why do we think it's a remnant continental microplate? Well, the nature of the crust underlying the plateau in the basin, it's, it's debated, but it's probably 13 so to 25. So the plateau is here in yellow. We can sort of see it also in the cross section. This um, gray box highlights the plateau. So it's probably 13 to 25 kilometers of uh, mixed continental to magmatic crust. And in the southwest of the Santos Basin, there is this aborted uh, oceanic spreading ridge propagator uh, that has been identified. That's the Abimel uh, Ridge outlined in black here. And this connects further to the uh, Cabo Frio Benguela transform. So assuming that our interpretation of the Sao Paulo platform as a continental microplate is correct, um, what kind of rift interaction led to the formation of this microplate? 
So to this end, we modeled the entire um, microplay evolution with numerical models over 25 million years of model time. And again, we used the aspect code to set up a 3D thermomechanical box model and we extended east-west now at um, 20 millimeters per year. And the compositional structure consists of four viscoplastic layers of different composition and rheology. So there's um, 25 kilometers of upper crust, 10 kilometers of lower crust, then there's lithospheric mantle and um, a steamosphere underneath. And most importantly, we include these two uh, notches that you can see in the top view um, towards the south and the north up the boundary where we slightly raise the LAP again. So this is where initially um, deformation will focus. And then we vary the underlap and the offset of these two notches, as well as the ratio of upper to lower crust and the depth of the LAP. So I summarize here the results for the entire offset um, underlap parameter space. And what we see is the top views of the elevation in blue to green after 25 million years. And then the strain rate is in grayscale. And then the orange lines um, outline the landward limit of the oceanic crust. So it's easy to see that there are four connection regimes, four connection types between the two approaching rifts. And um, three we've seen earlier um, in continental rift models of homogeneous lithosphere. And that's, so for 100 kilometers, this oblique connection, for 200 kilometers, this more transform type of connection. And then for 400 kilometers, there is, um, the, the rifts don't mechanically interact and one of them dies out, the other one um, connects to the boundary. And then uh, exciting part, <laughs> I think you saw it coming, for 300 kilometers, um, there's a, a microplate actually forming and we'll look at its evolution um, in the next slide. But first I want to mention that it also seems that the underlap, so along the vertical axis here, doesn't have a lot of effect. And that's probably due to the effect that the amount of underlap is like a time dependent um, thing, right? So with the risk propagating, underlap decreases and then the offset is, is the, the determining factor. So only at um, 400 kilometers underlap, we see a microplate um, forming. So this might be the, the boundary between the two regimes. Now, one other interesting thing to note here is that for a model domain that is 900 kilometers in, in Y direction, so a long rift direction, um, instead of 600 kilometers and an otherwise unchanged model setup, we do get a rotating microplate instead of this rift failure. So in, in larger domains, microplates can form for offsets even larger than 400 kilometers. Okay, so let's check how this model evolved over time. So this is for 300 kilometers offset and um, underlap. And then by 2 million years, the rifts have propagated towards the unperturbed center area. They overlap for about um, 230 kilometers and the rift tips curve inward. They cannot connect to the opposite rift, however, so um, a block in between, a rigid block in between forms with, um, yeah, that's independently counterclockwise rotating. Then by uh, 17 million years, oceanic seafloor spreading has started on both the rift arms and uh, microplate rotation continues as the rifts migrate west and east respectively and they propagate north-south and around 25 million years the eastern rift arm reaches um, the southern boundary and the, this attaches the microplates to the uh, western plate and then by it, the western rift dies out by 26 and a half million years and this leaves a 240 kilometer wide uplifted microplate core. Now during the rotation of the microplate, it, the rotation actually adds like this small compressional component to the rift tips. 
And this results in slightly slower rift propagation and then more diffuse deformation and this prolongs the rotation phase. Um, besides offset, the crustal strength also seems to uh, shift the regime boundaries between the different types of linkage. So by increasing the amount of lower crust that's going down the vertical axis here, um, we get a stronger lower crust. So the overall crust is stronger and the ratio of plastically to viscously deforming material increases. And this in turn results in great, greater plastic strain localization and folds connecting instead of diffusing, um, diffusely propagating forwards. And therefore the um, overlap that is generated is smaller and at high strength, so these two bottom rows, uh, larger initial offsets are needed to generate transform folds. So we only see them for 300 kilometers offset and uh, microplates do not form. So if we invert that, we can also say that the presence of microplates informs us on the rheology of the crust. Now, in terms of lithospheric strength, we see that the formation of oblique folds is possibly is possible at higher offsets. So that would be this one for the strongest lithosphere. Um, and also that when the lithosphere is too thin, so too weak, the initial perturbation that we provide to it um, is not enough to drive localization. And we only see this top row of distributed deformation. Now there might be this um, dependence of the size of the microplate on the lithospheric thickness, but we did not investigate that further. Okay, so how do these microplate models compare to these proposed ancient microplates in the Atlantic margin? Mm. As I showed before, the Sao Paulo um, plateau is situated in the Santos Basin, results from the rifting uh, between South America and Africa in the early Cretaceous. And after about 10 million years of rifting, the Tristan da Cunha plume um, impinged on the South American plate, uh, emplacing large volumes of basalt in the basin. So the, the basin's uh, crust is um, continental to magmatic. Now, according to plate reconstructions, northward propagation of the southern South Atlantic spreading ridge into this Abimel Ridge region and southward propagation of the central South Atlantic Ridge led to the overlap of the two ridges and then the Abimel Ridge became extinct. So this leaves this um, plate about uh, 140 kilometers wide. Now if we look at the SPP model uh, for 300 kilometer offset and overlap, it shows a very similar geometry. We have the filled Western Rift, the active um, Eastern Rift, and but the microplate that has formed is about twice the size and also thicker, as we can see from the cross sections, than um, what is actually observed. Also, there are no fracture zones have formed, and well, there are several things that could could we could have led to these differences between the models, uh, between the models and the observations. So we know that the crustal thickness and the lithosphere thickness have some effect. We also know that um, changes in um, the extension direction could have uh, favored different linkage or different uh, propagation directions. And one component that is obviously lacking from the model is the impingement of a plume and the subsequent melting and extrusion. However, we did test a thermal plume arriving after 10 million years of extension, and this does not change the overall geometry of the microplate um, and the rifts. But the exact location of the bloom can determine which of the rifts fails. Then the Flemish cap is a continental block found off the coast of Newfoundland. And it's uh, from the Mesozoic breakup of Pangaea, opening the Northern Atlantic Ocean. And um, this orphan basin is underlain by extended continental crust. The orange lines indicating hyperextended crust. So this is so interpreted as a um, failed drift. The uh, Flemish cap is thought to have rotated 40 degrees 
clockwise and also translate it uh, two to 300 kilometers uh, with respect to North America. Um, recent plate reconstructions also show this independent rotation, and this is why we propose it's a, a remnant continental microplate. Now, when we flip the microplate model um, like this, we obtain a model geometry that's um, after 30 million years, that's very much like the Flemish cap. So we have the clockwise rotation about 50 degrees of the microplate, and um, it, it's about uh, 280 kilometers off the Western coast. The Western Rift has gone extinct and new oceanic crust has formed um, along the Eastern Rift, as it's also seen in this magnetic anomaly um, off the Flemish Cap coast. One, one discrepancy is that um, there was oceanic crust uh, generated by the Western Rift, um, which is not observed. So, well, it's not observed, but the seismic velocities in this um, cross section also do not preclude um, oceanic crust. Okay, so to summarize what we've learned from the second set of models of rift initiation to seafloor spreading, one, uh, different types of rift connections form depending on the lateral offset of the approaching rifts, which was also shown in previous modeling. So they're oblique transform and microplate connections. And two, there is this sweet spot for microplate formation for offsets larger than 200 kilometers and this weak to moderately strong crust. And three, <laughs> the uh, presence of microplates in, can also inform us on the strength of the crust uh, of the microplate at the time of formation. And finally, continental promontories in uh, rifted margins probably formed like uh, as microplate connections. And this, these modeled microplate kinematics can act as a template for other promontories worldwide like Porcupine and the Falkland Islands microcontinent. Uh, thank you, uh, Anne. I'll applaud. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, sorry, your video disappeared for a second there. I was just confused. Uh, very interesting stuff. Very cool models. Um, are there any questions for Dr. Glare? Uh, James Condor, if you'd like to ask your question, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Anne. It's a really interesting talk. Uh, wondering a little, little bit about your last two examples, though, the uh, Sao Paulo Plateau and the Flemish Cap. And the, those microplates, they seem to be, you know, associated with opening of the Atlantic, where your models don't really capture that part of it. I mean, you alluded to a little bit that you didn't have the oceanic crust um, observed when your model predicts it, but it seems it's because you've got continental oceanic rifting going on in both of these cases. And I'm wondering how that's really going to affect how you're viewing these. Um, so, Yes, so we're, we're rifting initially a continental lithosphere, continental crust, but um, over time we break up the continental lithosphere and then we start producing um, oceanic lithosphere. And, and, and this is um, what we see in the, in the white areas. And this is what would correspond to the ocean. So. Yeah, but, but I wonder, so for instance, if you, um, let's go to the Sao Paulo example for a moment. Mm -hmm. You've got, if I understand it right, you have um, two propagating overlapping spreading centers. One's propagating north, one's propagating south. Whereas the unzipping was really just predominantly north. Ah, uh, that way. Hmm. Well, so what I, what I, how I understood it is that there, there were two, um, there was the Southern um, South Atlantic Ridge and the central section. And 
um, the southern one propagated northward and the central one propagated southward. So then uh, you would have these two overlapping um, ridge segments. And the southern one would then end in this Ab Abigail um, ridge over here with its northward propagation. I don't, I don't think the central one propagated that far south, but I don't want to belabor the point. It was a good talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in the chat, there's a question from uh, Daya Shankar um, about what is the angular velocity of the microplate? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so um, from, from these uh, oceanic microplates, like Easter, it's it's like they're very fast. So it's like 60 and 70 degrees per million years. Um, and then for these, um, like the East Africa model, that's more like 0 0.07 degrees per million years. So that's a, a like whole lot of magnitudes different. And then these, um, the latter ones that I showed, they're like 50 degrees in, in 30 million years. So it's 1.7 1, 1. Um, degrees per million year. So the, yeah, the continental ones are a lot slower than the oceanic ones. So it depends on the area of the plate also. Could you repeat that question, please? Uh, this angular velocity also depend on the area of the plate, microplate? Uh, the size, yeah, I do think that um, matters. Yeah, and also with the oceanic plates, once they grow, they also slow down. Okay, thank you. For a nice talk. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John and Karnasian, you had a question in the chat. Would you like to unmute and ask him? Hi, uh, really intriguing talk. I haven't thought much about microplates, but um, my question is, what was the maximum size of a microplate that can rotate? Because as you show, the rotation is driven by traction along the edges. And I would mm -hmm. think at some point, the plate might be too massive to be rotated by that mechanism. Yeah, so we, we haven't, tested the limit <laughs> of the microplate. But um, this the East African one is, um, what is it, like 750 wide? Right, it's pretty, oh. it's huge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's one of the largest, yeah. yeah. But um, if we want to test it, I think we also have to think about the domain of the, the model that we test it with, because that, um, like we saw with the, um, the failed rifts, there's like a, a domain size, an effect of the domain size on whether a microplate forms or not for the really high offset. So we have to think about the size of the offset with respect to the size of the domain. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there other questions for Dr. Glarum? I have a question. Yeah, I was going to say, Suzanne Baldwin, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Keely. Um, thanks very much for a great talk. I was very interested to learn about your models. Um, I was just wondering, and maybe I missed this at the beginning when you were discussing your initial and boundary conditions for your models. Um, how is magmatism accommodated in your models? Do you have any way to... Um, test your model results against the magmatic evolution, mm. in particular with respect to the East African rift zone. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because we, we have one rift branch that's very magmatic and the other one's not, um, yeah. So in the models, there is no magma, there's no melting, there's no magma um, production in the models. So what we can show is when the, cr the continental crust is broken up. This is the moment that we say there is um, um, oceanic crust 
productions of seafloor spreading. And this is what we outline with the, with the orange lines. Um, so in that sense, I cannot say it from these models. There, there are two ways we could look at this, and that's by doing like a post-processing of the temperature and see where we, we could produce melt. Um, but aspect is actually also capable of um, incorporating melting and freezing and um, the transport of melt. But I haven't actually ran those models. But yes, that would be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mohamed Goiza, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, thanks, Anne, for the, the talk. I was wondering about, because you have uh, production of oceanic crust in your models, and I was wondering actually about the boundary conditions once you reach continental breakup. Does, do you change the boundary conditions? Because initially your model actually you have imposed velocities in the boundary, but then once you break the, the lithosphere, you start actually having the, the dynamic actually of the system starts actually being controlled by the, 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 the accretion of oceanic crust and the ridge push. And I was wondering if that actually you think will have an influence on, on the, the, the dynamic of those microplates that you have in your models. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, so we don't have, so we don't actually have the production of oceanic crust, right? We just, um, we, we have breakup of the continental lithosphere and then the um, mantle reaches the surface and this cools and this leads to higher uh, viscosity areas, but we don't actually have like con uh, oceanic crust being produced. Um, so we do extend for the whole time. We do prescribe this extension, these extensional velocities uh, on the boundaries, but um, yeah, I can imagine that this would indeed change the dynamics. Um, that's probably also why, no. Yeah, I haven't thought about this rich push component, uh, how that would change. Um, change the situation. Interesting. Yeah, just something that I thought of, so yeah. Yeah, good point. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? That said, we do uh, have a free surface so we do generate like topography uh, over time. Um, which, is, which is different from if we would actually have like produce, produce um, oceanic crust, but still there are like topography variations that, that, that can act. So there, if there's GPE, this would be included in the model just to add on to that last. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Oh, yes, uh, Alan Baxter, you have a question. Hi, sorry. Uh, thanks, Anne, for, for the talk. It was great. I'm, uh, I'm really interested about these propagating rifts because I look at them uh, in a different setting, in a back arc setting. But mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering about uh, some con microcontinental blocks that do get rifted off of continents and then are uh, isolated within oceanic crust. So I'm thinking off the coast of Western Australia. So when uh, Gondwana rifted um, uh, it, uh, between uh, uh, South, uh, sorry, Africa and, and Australia, or sorry, between India and Australia, um, you get all of these continental blocks. I wonder if the same process that you're modeling here, if it just breaks through, if the propagating rift breaks through, then you would get that isolated continental blocks that you do see in the middle of the the uh, South Indian Ocean. Um, so I wonder if they are, or if they are also microplates, but they have then been completely rifted off. Hmm. Yeah, we have some models where where um, the rifts connect to the rift and not to the boundary. So you do get this isolated block. Um, so that could very well be, but I haven't actually looked at those locations. You would need you would need the the inner rift to be the main rift then to continue spreading. So then those blocks do. Uh, so I don't know if that, 
uh, if that would be different from your models. But it's it's really interesting. Just there's different evolution that sometimes it does make a microplate, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it can completely it could probably isolate the blocks in the middle mm. of these. Levels. Yeah, that's really excellent. Uh, I love the models; they're great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Uh, well, then I will I will ask one question if any see if anybody else has other question. I was just curious. You had mentioned that um, you tested the idea of a plume. So I work deep in the mantle. So this is the part that I'm kind of intrigued as to have to get <laughs> below the 300 kilometers you went. Um, the idea of a plume that sort of appeared around um, 10 million years, and but it wasn't really affecting. And so do you have plans going forward to look more at how um, that sort of thermal structure might be affecting any of these? Um, so, so Yes, <laughs> this is a, a very interesting. Um, so, um, for me, I'm I I focus more on East Africa. So, of course, here there is also a plume or multiple plumes or small plumes, and in the upper mantle, it's not completely clear. Um, but it, the models I'm I'm currently trying to set up are more data driven, so they're less. Um, less generic as the ones we saw in the uh, in the presentation and they're more um, trying to incorporate different kinds of observations so for example as we can see on the top left we have this lib structure and crystal structure from um, crust 1.0 or like and several regional um, thickness models Mm, and um, i also include like a mantle temperature structure from different seismic tomography models so that we can incorporate this thermal structure and whatever flow it generates um, and like um, drag or uh, push on the, um, on the lithosphere. And um, I think here, this is an example of um, like, so this is the top view of the model. And again, in grayscale, we see the localization of deformation around the Victoria microplate that is outlined by the lakes in, in black. Um, and that's just from the current lithospheric structure that we observe. And um, I would like to run those models um, over, over 10 million years and see how that um, evolves as well. Um, and then, yeah, yeah. So more <laughs> data-driven setups okay. that also include. Um, I, I also created um, plugins like boundary conditions where we can prescribe like hot blobs going into the um, domain so that we have more like a, a more self-consistently involving mantle plume, and so we can test the effects of uh, of that as well. Oh, very cool. Okay. <laughs> Looking forward to this, thanks. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, are there any last questions for Dr. Claire? If not, uh, let us all thank Dr. Ann Claire for giving us this talk. I'll applaud for Thank you all for being here. <laughs> you get the virtual applause if you can see it in the speakers. Awesome. Okay. <laughs>